All right, so I'm going to continue my series on uh, Sub-Saharan African uh, colonial history. And um, basically, I'm going to be running into a lot of topics that are going to be somewhat political and controversial. And so I kind of wanted to make a, a stop um, and sort of explain basically the term revisionism is going to come up um revisionist history and i kind of wanted to make a stop actually uh in the great plains during the uh great sioux war to uh discuss why the term revisionism or revisionist history is actually a fallacy um it's bullshit um and so bear with me this is going to be kind of a uh, kind of long um Basically, when you have a historic event that takes place, um, I think it was Albert Camus that developed this theory that everything in the world and throughout the history of time is all basically happening at the same time, but people are viewing it from different perspectives, so it appears to be linear. And... I honestly think that that's complete bullshit as with most of existentialism and nihilism, but that is an excellent analogy for revisionist history. And that is, you know, the eye of the beholder and, you know, of course, who is in political power at the time and sort of what the circumstances are surrounding the event. And it's basically impossible for things to escape politics and the battle of little bighorn or the Battle of Greasy Grass, as it was known to the Sioux Nation, is the best example I can think of of this. So, I'm sure everybody has heard of Custer's Last Stand. It's Battle of Little Bighorn, you know, Greasy Grass. And there are two different camps as far as what happened in the battle. Now, first you have the... Now, I've actually gone and done this because I was, this is one of the first historical topics that I got really into because uh, I actually have um, uh, some Sioux uh, heritage in me. Um, I've heard, <clears throat> it's not entirely reliable, but basically what I was led to understand is that I'm something like a quarter Sioux Blackfoot, but I don't know if that's true or not, but it kind of got me fascinated with this subject because uh you know it was a great victory for the Sioux and so on and so forth and so I've been out to Little Bighorn I've read um uh, an excellent source too I'm sorry to you know digress again but um uh period textbooks so an interesting way to study a subject is to read basically just high school history textbooks but from different years. You get one, so this took place in the 1800s. You get one from the 1800s, like where it was fresh. Read about it from that. And these things are all very accessible. They're not, you know, any old bookstore is going to have a whole section of just old college and high school history textbooks. So you get one from the 1800s. You get one from the 1900s. You know, you get one from more modern times. And you can watch this story sort of progress from different viewpoints. You can talk you know, you get early, you can, you can read about firsthand accounts and then you sort of get a little later, you read about the interpretations of those accounts, you read about sort of the political motivations behind those interpretations and it gets interesting and that sort of will give you a bigger picture than uh, Google Foo will, is, is what I'm trying to say. So back to my original point, you have two different camps when it comes to the Battle of Little Bighorn. You have the American exceptionalist version, which is sort of Custer was ambushed by the the Plains Indians and he made a heroic last stand against overwhelming odds and there's these portraits of him on top of a white horse waving his saber. It's very Napoleonic, you know, it's it's dramatic and this man was a hero and, you know. Then you have the other camp, which is a more modern camp, uh, which is Custer ambushed, you know, these poor Indian women and children and the brave warriors of the the Sioux Nation, you know, rode in and, and stopped him, you know. And, and what's interesting is 
really neither of that is true. <laughs> Um, and and it's, it's amazing almost the amount of work you have to put in to sort of discover that. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to basically tell the real story and then I'm going to talk about why we sort of devolved into these two commonly held beliefs about the battle. And I actually had to make notes for this one because I couldn't remember the um, all the people involved. So... You've got your, your Sioux Nation, which is made up of the Lakota, the Cheyenne, and the Arapaho, all right? And they are about 25,000 strong estimated in the battle. And then you've got your 7th Cavalry with about a dozen or so Crow and uh, Akara, I believe. I'm probably not pronouncing that right. Scouts. So, basically, what took place... Um, and this is going to be, again, a three-dimensional thing because you can't just say, oh, well, these guys fought these guys. And there's always multiple dimensions to that. you got to know what was going on before, what was going on after, what were the technologies of the time, what were the military tactics of the time, what happened. So luckily for you, I've gone and done all this research. You're going you to learn. <laughs> so before... Or rather, right at the beginning of U.S. settlers slowly sort of venturing out into the plains and kind of trespassing on territory, you had the these tribes, the Lakota, the Cheyenne, and the Arapaho. And then you had your Crow and your, I can't pronounce, Akara, I'm not quite sure. But they were at war with each other. And the Crow were somewhat getting their ass kicked. Uh, they weren't doing so hot. The, the basically those, those th the first three tribes, Lakota, Cheyenne, Arapaho, they make up the Sioux Nation with a couple of other tribes, and they basically had united against the Crow and uh, a few other smaller tribes that the Crow were buddies with. And they were getting their asses kicked. And on top of that, both of these tribes were sort of indiscriminately attacking settlers who were wandering onto their land and saying, you know... Hey, this is ours now. Does that sound familiar? British, Boer? Okay. <laughs> so along comes the U.S. Cavalry and the Crow go, Hey, you know, we might not always get along, but, you know, why don't we work together and get rid of these uh, Sioux Nation guys? What do you say? And then maybe we can work out something on the side. So the U.S. Cavalry goes, you know, we need guides, we need people that know the terrain, we need people that speak the language, so on and so forth, and aligning ourselves with a local tribe is a good idea. So let's do it. So now, in doing that, yes, they, they gained a tactical advantage, but they also aligned themselves politically with everything going on in the region. So now imagine... The French invade America and sort of side with the Republicans against the Democrats. <laughs> that's, that's essentially what happened. You know, without even knowing it, they just sort of picked whatever political party would work with them. And now they're going to work with, you know, you, you would, you'd one, be pissed that people were invading your country. And two, be pissed that now you have, you know, this sort of political, you know, basically these guys are working with your sworn enemies. So this escalated things, and of course these skirmishes increased between the two tribes and between the cavalry and between settlers. It was a clusterfuck, and this is what became known as the, the, the Great Sioux War. Um, so we fast forward to now Greasy Grass. With the help of Crow guides, um, Crow and these uh, Akira, Akira and, uh, I'm sorry, um, the 7th Cavalry goes, all right, I'm gonna, we're going to go wipe out the Sitting Bull character. Sitting Bull was kind of the, the big El, El Yenaral of the, uh, the Sioux Nation there. He, sort of, he had his 25,000 braves, and you know he was, a, he was a force to be reckoned with. He was a brilliant military commander. So they had intelligence from the Crow that there is a, a couple of these, you know, um, a couple of Sitting Bull's guys out here, we're going to go ambush them and we're going to take care of it. We just need, you know, the 7th Cav, which is around 700 guys, and we're going to go clean this up easy peasy and, you know, put an end to this shit. So they roll out there and they run into 
not a couple of guys, but, you know, almost 3,000 Braves who are armed with superior weapons who basically proceed to mop the fucking floor with the 7th Cavalry. Um, essentially, the U.S. Cavalry at the time, and now people, this is a lot different today because I was in the Cavalry. So... <laughs> The, uh, the U.S. Cavalry at the time was something akin to the French Foreign Legion. If you were a criminal or a debtor or a general sack of shit, now there was exceptions, of course, to every rule, but you're basically, your option was, you know, starve to death on the street or join the U.S. Cav and go fight in the Indian Wars. You were kind of, these were sort of made up of the, kind of the worst guys you could, you could imagine. These were not brave well i mean they were brave they fought bravely there's a lot of you know heroic actions during the, the great sioux war but it, it, think about a rabble of criminals basically who are given uniforms and something like two hours of training i think that uh if you look at historical documents um the u.s cavalry at the time was using a single shot trapdoor rifle and i think they were issued like five rounds a month for training or something like that so we didn't have we didn't have the defense budget um, back then that we do now. So these guys would get a couple of rounds and just to instill confidence in their weapons, and then they were sent, you know, out to fight with these things. So you've got a modern military with single shot rifles. Then you've got the Sioux Nation under Sitting Bull, who went out and bought themselves some uh, nice shiny new Winchester repeaters. Now, when you think about a single shot rifle versus uh, a Winchester repeater. Now these are both very old technology, but that would be like, it, it, it's something akin to facing a, like a machine gun with a blunderbuss. I mean, it's just, you combine that, you know, modern, the most modern technology with overwhelming numbers and then sort of irregular tactics. I mean, the cavalry were disciplined. They would sort of, you know, roll up, dismount their horses, get in little formations, and, you know, commence the volley fire, whereas the Indians would just sort of blitzkrieg into their lines with these repeating rifles and just immediately break any sort of um, defensive lines they would put up. So, basically, what happened was, is, you know, bad intelligence and poor equipment, and poor training. So how does that turn into Custer's heroic last stand, you know, sort of this deified individual? Well, basically what you had was Custer's widow going to Washington at the time and sort of uh, lobbying for, you know, the benefit of the, the cavalry and the benefit of the military and so on and so forth. And, and, and sort of in the process, the, they, this was politicized. Basically, Custer was, you know, deified and the Indians were vilified and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's why if you look at history books at the time, you get that sort of Napoleonic image of Custer, you know, on his white horse, waving his saber, so on and so forth. And, and, and can you really blame her? I mean, she lost her husband in, in a pretty horrible way. A lot of these guys were, you know... Uh, not only you know killed, but they were their bodies were mutilated. It was pretty fucking horrible. So, how do we get the second camp now? The heroic Indians that were ambushed by the evil Custer, and he killed women and children. Well, I think we all know what happened there. There's a movement in this country, a very big anti-imperialist, anti-colonialism movement, which has a lot of its roots in Marxism. And like it or not, those are the facts surrounding that. So what happens is people tinker a little bit with history and they make it fit their narrative for political means. And this happened back in the 1800s with, you know, Custer being made a hero, and then it happened again in the 90s with Custer being made a villain. But the fact of the matter is, neither of those things are true. Nobody was a hero. Nobody was a villain. Nobody had a necessarily noble cause behind this. The cavalry was trying to protect U.S. settlers. 
The Crow were trying to eliminate the Sioux Nation. The Sioux Nation was trying to eliminate the cavalry, the settlers, and the Crow. <laughs> so you got to be careful. When you look at these things, you have to look at the big picture. Because revisionist history is... Every history is revisionist history. There's no, there is no piece of history out there that has not been politicized. So now, I want you to take this into account when I get further into colonial Africa, because there's going to be some stuff between the Zulu and the Zosha and a couple of these tribes that are going to be very reminiscent of what happened with the Plains Indians, and especially sort of this vilification of the uh, imperialist, colonialist, you know, so on and so forth. And it's kind of interesting that a lot of these people pointing the finger at, you know, sort of colonialist Europeans, these Native Americans, and then of course these, you know, African tribes were imperialists. They conquered these lands that, you know, were then taken from them by the whites. So these were not their native lands. <laughs> So you need to look at the big picture. You need to understand that everything is going to go through a political filter. And just sort of, you know, keep an open mind. It's really difficult to do, especially these days. Everybody is just polarized into one belief or another. But you have to look at history objectively. And not everything is going to align itself with your political beliefs. I mean, uh, sure, that would be great, but... The fact of the matter is, it's never going to happen. You know, history is this uh, sort of bucking bronco. It's just going to go whatever direction it goes, you know? So that'll lead us into our uh, African colonies during um, the World Wars video. And then I'm going to go into more modern uh, Bush War stuff. That's where it's going to get really hairy. So please uh, bear with me on that. All right, thanks.